Well, first of all, congrats on the film and its very successful festival run. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, I watched it the other day and really, really liked it. Um, okay. It it wasn't what I was expecting, if that makes sense. That that's been the most common critique. Can 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 you unpack that? Like, I think I know what everyone means, but I'm curious what it means for for you. Well. I guess what what I mean by that is that it felt more like an an eighties action movie than like a crime thriller. Ah, okay, very cool. Nice. Um, so I I guess that's a good place to start off with. Um, what was your intent with uh with the movie? Uh, it was pretty much exactly that. It was um, it was heavily inspired from the nineteen seventies gritty crime films where people are doing like coke in the streets and wearing fur coats but uh like that kind of environment and then um meshed with a more modern day look to it so like something in the hybrid of like a michael mann like neon noir type of uh drive kind of movie so so that was the whole uh thought behind it and then it was making this this crime drama action film that just kept picking up speed as it went along. Nice. Um, at the beginning of the movie, it says that this was based on true events. Um, can you explain that a little bit more? For sure. Uh, that's a good question. So um, the movie is based on a good friend of mine who I've known for probably 20 years now. He started growing uh, marijuana in his bedroom, expanded into a warehouse, had a dispensary, just kept going and going and going. And I got a lot of boots in the ground um, knowledge just watching his journey. I never participated in any of it, but uh, just watching his journey and always being very intrigued by it and, and learning a lot about the laws too. And what ended up happening is in 2016, when um, I think it's Prop 64, Prop 65 passed in California, which basically made cannabis legal to buy for recreational use. When that passed, his business started going down and he was struggling. And, um, and, and, I, and I watched that transpire. And so... In the movie, the main character has much the same journey, and the film is based on true events that actually happened. And um, like no one, no one fortunately got killed or anything like that. Like that part, I I made up. But but basically, the the backdrop and the vehicle um, is all is all based on actual events. And I just basically put a character in some very heightened state within that world. Oh, very cool. Yeah. I, I'm glad that no one got killed in real life. <laughs> no, no one got killed. People got chased and 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 had to hide in places, but no one got killed. Um in watching the movie, I felt like there were some really interesting style choices, um, especially uh the part where Vincent's sitting on the bus and like he's getting flashes of things that just happened. Um and I, I felt that that was a really powerful moment. Um, but can you explain kind of what went into the choices you made when filming? Yeah, so uh, to talk about that one first off, that was not a choice of mine. That was Ryan who cut the movie. Um, we delivered the film in rails, so there's five rails in this movie. And um, and when he delivered that rail, he, he had those three um, jump cuts in it or smash cuts. And at first I was like, ooh, I, I wasn't expecting it. Um, and it worked really well. So we, we just sort of developed a little bit more. So he did that. And as far as like the style of the movie, I basically uh, built the aesthetic from the budget that I had available. So I knew going to the movie, I was dealing with a micro budget film. There wasn't gonna be a lot of, of, of money spent on, on lights and crew and, and uh, script supervisor or makeup or anything like that. So what I did was I've been shooting on the red for a long time now. And then, and I've been coloring on the red for a long time, not me personally coloring, but overseeing color. 
So I know the latitude of the color and where I can take it. So I was like, okay, let me, I can shoot this with minimal lights and, and work with my DP, Dominic Lopez, who did an amazing job of doing this aesthetic where we don't need to use a lot of lights, like, like in the Revenant, you know, they didn't use, I don't think they used any lights in that, but, um, but that's, that's how I built it. I was like, okay, that will make my world a little bit more gritty and feel like the seventies style that I want combined with this synth wave neon noir that I know I can make and basically just utilizing environments. So because I didn't have a production designer or prop person or anything like that, um, I was able to get really lush environments um, and and use that as my production design. So shooting a lot of exteriors in the river and LA bridges and tunnels um, and marijuana fields, like like you can't, you don't need a production designer for that stuff. You know, it's kind of, it's built in. Um, so, so definitely um, aesthetic uh, dictated the visual. It's kind of the same thing, but the, but the, the budget dictated the, the mm -hmm. visual. Cool. <clears throat> and to my understanding, this is Anthony's first leading role in, in a, a feature film. Um, what was it about him that made him the perfect Vincent? We had a um, a couple choices of people that I narrowed it down to. And I was mostly looking for someone that had some stunt experience because I wanted the person jumping over walls and falling, getting punched, running, all, all this stuff. And I didn't want to get a double or someone that didn't look athletic um, nor uh, nimble. I, I wanted them to have that that natural quality. You could root for them. I could keep it all on screen. So my producer, Carl Safarlio, who's a veteran stunt coordinator, he's been around for a long time. You may know him. Have, have you ever seen Casino? Probably. With, I don't know. Robert De Niro. Well, I'm sure oh, some, someone yeah. watching has seen it. Yeah, Robert De Niro, yeah. Joe Pesci. There's a scene where Joe Pe Pesci has a guy's head in the vice. He's trying to get information from him. So that that was my stunt coordinator, the guy with his head in the vice. Um, cool. And he knew Anthony well. Um, Anthony was in Black Mass and The Fighter uh, as well. And so he was like, hey, just meet him up. I was like, okay. So met with Anthony. Um, and I knew he had like a, a very big background behind him. Like he's worked with like, Eastwood and James Mangold and a bunch of others. So I knew this was somebody that I wanted to surround myself with that um, could could lead the film, and 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 it all made sense. And we we ended up going uh, that direction. I'm very glad that we did. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, what would you say were some of the biggest challenges you faced in? creating a movie where marijuana is essentially an additional character? Um, <clears throat> the marijuana part wasn't challenging because I, on top of my buddy um, who was in it, I had a couple other friends. So they introduced me to Jay who owned a farm and that was the farm that we shot at. So all the exterior shots were at the farm and then he had a warehouse on the property as well. So we made the location with like three locations. Um, so that part wasn't too challenging. The challenging part was it's a working farm, you know, and it's not like you're not growing tomatoes. So every plant is worth a lot more <laughs> and, and time is of the essence. So, so we're shooting around a working marijuana farm, but Jay was amazing, like such a great partner. He was actually, um, originally we expanded the, 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 um, his title out to co-producer at the end, because he was just so accommodating for, to us. Um, but yeah, that part wasn't challenging. If, if that was the question you were asking. Um, were there any other challenges that you faced? Everything. Um, but it was basically the schedule. So I didn't have a line producer. So, you know, when you're making a micro budget film like this, you're doing a lot of things yourself. Um, and so I basically, 
I made the schedule myself. Making the schedule was difficult because you're producing the movie too. You're putting it all together and trying to make a schedule. And I have over 60 locations. But I basically, I just leaned on my experience. So I was very ambitious with the screenplay. I knew what I was getting into when I wrote it. Um, and and I just I just swung for the fences. So I was like, let me just rely on everything I've done in the past, like the guerrilla filmmaking I've done and 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 do that like hyper tenfold so that that was the most challenging part was was actually completing this very ambitious film like if someone would ask me to do it again um in the same way like i'd probably run for the hills <laughs> can you describe uh guerrilla filmmaking like what that is yeah, so guerrilla filmmaking is the um, style of of shooting first and shooting first and asking for permission later. So you're basically going to um, uh, any environment or place or location and just unloading the circus, shooting what you got to shoot. And then leaving, knowing that the police can and will come, um, people may complain. Um, and like we're shooting with car rigs, so we have vans and cars with um, a camera rig on the hood or a camera rig on the side of the car. Mm -hmm. and we're driving through tunnels in Los Angeles with this and, and with no permits. So that's essentially part of it too, without permits. But uh, again, like I leaned into what I've been doing for a long time. Like I've been throughout my career so far shooting with permits, but also shooting without per permits because there's just certain locations that are impossible to get. So I knew going into it, this is a, a really good piece of advice or a tip. I don't advise people do it, but this is what I do is I know going into a location Number one, what I want to do is tell the people around the location what I'm doing. So whenever I arrive somewhere, if there's like garages or businesses or people outside, I go and I introduce myself. I'm like, hey, I'm Jonathan. I'm shooting a movie. I'm only here for like three hours, maybe two hours. This is what I'm doing. There's no guns. There's no anything, blah, blah. That eliminates those people from calling the cops on me. The other ones I have no control over. So what I can do is I can unload people start shooting by the time someone sees us and calls the cops it could be about an hour so the cops come they tell me i have to leave this didn't happen the cops did come this didn't happen though they tell me i have to leave i say okay we'll leave we start looking like we're leaving the cops leave i go back and i shoot again because the cops aren't coming back like for, for a while so that gives me two hours at least of shooting for free. Um, and that was the plan going into it that what I would do. Um, and they're most likely they won't arrest you in the second time. <laughs> it depends on your personality, but they could. Um, fortunately, that never happened. What did happen was the former that I described, where I just told people what I was doing. Um, the cops did come at least three times that I know of, three or four. We told them what we were doing. Um, and they saw we were very responsible and, and not doing anything too crazy and they let us go. We also shot this during the lockdown, so nothing was really going on in, in August of 2020. So, um, and I didn't, I wasn't overly greedy. I mean, yes and no. I mean, we shot on the LA river with like 20 people doing like a murder scene. So that could be a little greedy, but, um, I tried not to get too greedy with my choices. The The car rigs is definitely a little dangerous in regards to shooting on main streets with a car rig, especially when they're hanging off the side. But but we what we did all the time was we had a follow car or actually a follow car and then a lead car. And what that basically is, is everyone's on walkies or in this case, we can't afford walkies. So we're all on cell phone speakers or Bluetooth. And you have a picture car. And then you have a, a follow car behind you and then a lead car in the front. And, and that creates a nice little safe space. So that's what we did all the time. 
when we were shooting any car stuff. That's really cool. Kind of like working with what you have, but like being just like really crafty with it. Yeah, as resourceful as you can be. And, and getting everyone involved. Like, that was the main thing. When I met Anthony for the first time, I um, told him what we we're doing or described it. I was like, hey, you know, we're making a gorilla film with no permits. And this is what a day to day will look like. We're going to shoot for three hours in the field, pack up, drive somewhere else, shoot for three hours here, shoot for three hours there. And I was like, that's the style of the film. And that's what I told everyone that came aboard. I, like completely transparent. Everyone knew what they were getting in, into. And and surprisingly, the response was everyone was super excited. I think I think they they loved the danger of the whole thing. And and I think maybe they got the sense that I've done this before, this style, so they felt safe within it. Um, and that I was always very concerned about their safety. So we never were in any environment where anyone raised a red flag or was like hey i don't feel safe it was mostly me that was overly anxious and neurotic making sure everyone felt calm and cool and um and once you can get everyone on board with that which which we did it's it's do whatever you want so that's uh it created like i made this this micro budget film look way larger that's awesome yeah thanks. Um do you think using that that guerrilla style kind of aids in in the story and in the acting? Absolutely. Because everyone's heightened, you know? Like 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 when we're doing our takes, you never know if the police are coming. So you gotta like do your best. Um it's almost equivalent like when you shoot on film and 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 you only have so many takes. But um but yeah, ev everyone's senses are heightened. Um and and there's a much bigger feeling of anxiety but everyone was pretty chill no one like we we had a very chill set but but yeah you definitely heighten people's senses which is good because i wrote the screenplay to be this very heightened sense of like anxiety and tension so um but yeah like we were all laughing and stuff on set and stuff so it was, it was pretty chill, but yeah, <laughs> it definitely creates a different experience. I, I, I'd love to do it again. Like, like whatever movie I make next, like the budget is higher. I'd, I'd love to do something similar to that. Like granted we'll have permits and stuff, but keeping the crew size really small, um, it makes people feel very safe and they can explore and, and to keep that feeling of like this guerrilla film, although I know I can't replicate that um, again, just just because of the way things will go. But, um, but yeah, it's a pretty cool style. Yeah. yeah. Um, what is something that you are super excited for the audience to see when they go to watch this movie? Um, I'm excited for them because I don't know if it translates well. Um, I think it translates a little bit in the trailers, but it may not translate well in what they're uh, expecting going into it is is the tension that I built into the movie. Um, like like you're on this ride with this character and and I want them to like feel like they're on this like rocket ship of a ride as we get to the end. So I'm excited to like for that, for people to just to like, be really like tense while watching it, but not like overly anxious or anything like that. Um, that I'm excited about. And, and I'm excited too, like when we first started, you said it wasn't what you expected. And so like, I didn't know if that meant like, like you're expecting like a micro budget film to look like a micro budget film and it shot in a couple locations and um, and stuff like that. Like, uh, and then, but it wasn't that. So I'm excited to hear like that kind of response. Like, well, like, it wasn't what I expected. Like, I didn't know it would be like this, like epic gorilla film. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. It, it definitely felt so much bigger than what you had to work with. So. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad it, it, it translated. Um. So we are, we're right at 
time, but um, is there anything else that you would like to add about the last deal? Um, just thank you for the interview. Appreciate it. And um, hope people go watch it. We have a website, um, thelastdealmovie.com. And people can go there and uh, see the show times that we have upcoming. We're playing in 21 theaters, opening February 3rd. And then we're on VOD February 7th. And um, I think it's starting to populate right now on the VODs, like Amazon and Apple, that you can go there and save it or pre-order. So I want people to go watch it. And I hope they watch it on the biggest TV they can if they're watching it at home and turn the lights down and the volume up. Um, we shot the movie in, in 8K and it has a 5.1 surround sound. So um, wow. hoping to give like the best experience possible. Wow.